All right, without further ado then, uh, let me introduce an evening with Alan Dabney. <laughs> I want to thank Tom and Alan and the museum for having me out and do this, and I appreciate you coming out on a special on Good Friday. So thanks for uh, sharing your Friday evening with me. So I'm Alan Dabney, and I am a Catawba Indian, and I'm going to tell you about the greatest tribe of Indians in South Carolina. <laughs> and up here around the upstate, you're not familiar so much with Catawba since the Cherokees were very popular and prevalent around the upstate. So, but a little bit about the Catawba. Right now, there's a little over 3,100 registered Catawba members in South Carolina, and the reservation is in Rock Hill. So, we're, um, like most Indian tribes, the Catawbas were named by others. Not many people, not even many tribes are named by their own name because the Catawbas called themselves Nai or Hai, which is, that was their Catawba language, which is a Sioux language for the Catawbas. Now, they were named by others, so the name we know of the Catawbas now probably came from the Iroquois, which the Cherokee were Iroquois speaking, and they called them the Flatheads or the Catuas. So that's why the name came to be known as Catawbas, usually after about 1700. But the Spanish, from Hernando de Soto to Juan Pardo, when they came through South Carolina, the Catawbas were called the Isquas or the Isis. The Cherokee called the Catawbas the Anatibas. So the 17th century colonists called them the Ushus or the Usis or the Isis. So never did they ever get to call by their, their proper original name for themselves. So they're known now as the Catawbas. So the Catawbas are a Sioux language speaking tribe. And of the Sioux languages, there's two distinct dialects. Well, there's many dialects, there's two divisions of the Sioux language. There's the Western and then there's the Eastern Sioux. Now the Western Sioux, there's, there's four different delineations from that. It's the Crow and Hadatsa, the Missouri River. There's the Mississippi River, Mississippi River Sioux, which is the Winnebago's, the Osage, the Omaha's, and the Lakota's, that we know the Lakota Sioux. So the Lakota Sioux being the largest Sioux tribe in the West, and that's where the language has been known as the Sioux language. So there's also the Ohio River Valley Sioux with the Biloxi, the Ofos, and the Tulos. Then we have the Mandan Sioux, the Nuttars and the Nutars. So the eastern brand of Sioux language was the Catawbas and the Watkins. So it's, there's a, a lot of differences in the languages. Sometimes between one Sioux language and the other Sioux, the western and the eastern, could be just as different between English and Chinese. So a lot of different dialects inside of that. Now, the origin of the, of the Catawba Indians, they seem to think they could have come down from the Catawba, Ohio, the Kentucky or Ohio River Valley during the Woodland Period. So about 1,000 years BC was what originally thought. Now, they were the Woodland people. And of the Sioux languages we have around this area, the Catawbas, the Santees, the Chirals, the Congarees, the Corries, the Enos, and the Shakoris. We also have the Wakmals, which spoke a Sioux dialect also. Now, the southern part of South Carolina, along the Savannah River, there's the Muskegon, which is the creek in the Yamasees, which is south of Santee, coast to Savannah. Now, the Iroquois, the Cherokee, were part of the western part, one third of the state. So from the Catawba River up, the Brown River up, the Cherokees were well known through the mountains. Now there's also the Algonquins, Shawnees and the Lumbees. And the Algonquins, especially the Shawnees and the Cherokee, were longtime enemies of the Catawbas. And the, the Shawnees and the Lumbees were along the savannah between the Cherokee and the Muskegon branches of the two Indian tribes. So one of the historic homelands of the Catawbas it's been attributed as Kovatachiqui, which is outside of present-day Camden. But there are mounds there in Kovatachiqui and Camden, and the Catawbas were not mound builders. But they seem to think that the mound builders that came into Camden area around 1150 AD were part of the Mississippian culture. And those, along with the mounds of Elwood, Georgia, Mount Gilead, North Carolina, and some of the, the ones we had in Hiawassee, Georgia, a lot of the mounds were during that Mississippian culture 
time period. So the Sioux language people were not mound builders. So the ancestral home of the Catawbas were moving in after the Mississippi period Indians. And it was Pine Tree Hill was their home. This was right outside of Camden. So they were probably inhabiting some of the old village places of the old builders of the Kofatakwa people. Now the first contact with the Catawba from, from, the, from Europe was not through Hernando de Soto, because de Soto came up through Georgia from Florida, and he came in and he was looking for gold. So all the Spanish conquistadors were looking for gold. So he had ran into some of the Creek and the Yamasee Indians, and they told him about some of the towns where they had plenty of gold. So when he came up to Camden, present day Camden, he kidnapped the queen of Kofatachiki, and she took him up to the mountains of North Carolina to another part of their, their villages, which was called Jora, or Jora, which is also sound very similar to the Sheral Indians, which were later Sioux-speaking tribes. So the first actual contact with what could have been the Catawbas was from Juan Pardo in about 1566. But what he found were the Isis, which is what we're known as now. The, the annual festival that Catawbas do, they call it the Yaki Issa, which Catawbas call themselves the people of the river. So, and the Catawbas called their town at the time Yupaha. So the, the, the typical Catawba Indian, with their warriors, they would paint their faces red. They would have one eye painted with a white circle and one with a black circle around it. And they would slip their hair back in bear grease and animal fat grease. <coughs> and they dressed like most of the Indians and Native Americans at that time in skins and pelts. Now the headdress for the Catawbas were different. There were their feathers on the front of their headdress. So their feathers would be on the typical on the front side. Now their homes were not the long houses like the Cherokee had, but instead, excuse me, they were the round houses. So it was bent over saplings that they would attach other branches and trees to. They were covered in bark roofs and cattail mats. Now the the longtime enemies of the Catawbas have been the Tuscaroras, also an Iroquois tribe, the Shawnees, and of course the Cherokees. Now the, the friendly Indians to the Catawbas were historical family members with the young the Yamasees, the Lumbees, the Waterees, the Sugarees, the Wakamals, the Saponies, the Tulos, the Enos. So there are there are tens of tribes across South Carolina that you had never heard of before that were slowly absorbed into the Catawbas. And the Catawbas were a powerful nation of South Carolina. And their typical lands ran from up around Danville, Virginia, all the way down to the coast of South Carolina. So the Sioux-speaking tribes dominated South and Central and Southeast of South Carolina. Now, of all the times, the Catawbas had been friends of the colonists for hundreds of years. So, we'll get into the one time that they did not side with the colonists. But early in the 1700s, there was the Tuscarora Wars. And the Tuscaroras had been enemies of the Catawbas forever. And they, they were in central and western North Carolina. Now, the Tuscaroras were fighting with the encroachment of the white settlers, and they attacked New Bern on the eastern coast of North Carolina. So when they did that, the North Carolina asked South Carolina to help. So South Carolina used the Catawba Indians to help them in the fight against the Tuscaroras, and of course the Catawba were only too glad to fight the Tuscaroras. So the Tuscaroras um, had been attacking slaves, they had been attacking the Catawbas for years, taking slaves from the Catawbas. So the Catawbas were using their payment of slaves for their price to help the colonists. So the Catawbas would take the tribe, take the slaves from the Tuscaroras. So the Tuscarora War lasted for almost a year. And because of the ill treatment by the Catawba of the Tuscaroras, the war quickly started about two months later as the second Tuscarora War. So, now after the Tuscarora was defeated then in 1712, the second time, Tuscarora moved up north to New York. 
And the Tuscarora joined the five nations, and it became the six nations of the Iroquois nations, the Iroquois League of Nations, which were the Mohawk, the Nidas, the Onondagas, the Senecas, the Cayugas, and the Tuscaroras. So, even though that battle ended in 1712, they didn't sign an official treaty with the Iroquois until about 1751. So, the one time that the Catawba did not side with the colonists was in the Yamasee War, within 1715 to 1716. Now, the Yamasee, like a lot of the Native Americans at the time in South Carolina, had been ill-treated by slave traders, by the Indian traders, by the colonists, by the settlers, but were slowly encroaching into land. They were stealing their crops, and the treatment of their women, the colonists, would often would kidnap the Indian women and take them and sell them into slavery down to Jamaica, to Jamaica and to the islands. So when the Yamasee, who were a Creek-speaking tribe, when they rebelled against the colonists, a lot of the other Indians had felt the same way against the colonists, so the Catawbas joined them. Now along with the Catawbas were all of their allies which joined the Creeks, which joined the Yamasees to fight against the colonists. <coughs> Now, all the tribes of South Carolina and North Carolina joined in against the colonists. And the two tribes that would not join were the Cherokee and the Chickasaw. And the Cherokee would not join because they had had a long-standing dispute with the Yamasee and the Creek Indians. So, when that war started, there were, let's see, at first some of the attacks came down into Port Royal and they killed about 40 settlers. Well, by July, the Catawas had had enough of the war for supplies, they, needed, they didn't have enough people, they didn't like the war being so close to their homeland. So because of that, the Catawas sued for peace with the colonists. And as usual in Indian politics, they turned on the Yemenis. So not long after that, the Cherokees did join the fight then. When the Catawas pulled out, against the Yamasees, the Cherokee did not want to fight the Catawas. So they joined with Catawas and fought the Yamasees to drive the Yamasees down into Florida. Now those raids continued until 1718 and the attacks into the 1720s. But um, the Yamasee War was the largest, most far-reaching Indian war ever in the colonies at the time. Now that war stretched from Cape River the Cape Fear River in North Carolina down to St. Mary's River down in Florida and in west to the Georgia-Alabama border. So this war cost the colonists 21, in today's money, with $21.6 million over 400 colonists to kill. So that was the largest insurrection against the colonists by the Native Americans of all time here in the U.S. So, and because of that war, and because that the Catawbas had sided against the colonists, the penalty for the Catawbas were to have 11 of their, the sons of the Catawba chiefs were to be sent to Virginia to, to maintain the loyalty of South Carolina as payment. So 11 of their sons went to live with the white man. And we'll see one of those sons later who comes back because of his education and training, he comes back as a great chief. Now, long, not long after that was the French and Indian War, or the Seven Years War, the King Philip's War, as we know. And during those wars with the Indians, the British colonists and the American colonists, along with Native Americans, were fighting the French. And the French were also using a lot of the Cherokees were siding on with the French, along with some of the other northern tribes. Now, the Cherokee War came with South Carolina colonists as an internal war during the same time period for about four years against the Cherokees. So, and we know about the Cherokee War because the Long Cane Creek Massacre right down the road down in McCormick. Now, the Long Cane Creek Massacre down in McCormick was uh, Catherine Montgomery Calhoun, which is John C. Calhoun's grandmother, and she was killed in that raid by the Cherokees on the wagon train down near McCormick. So, now long after, not long after this, about the same time frame, there was the, uh, the chief of the Catawas, and his name was not Kihi, also known as King Hagler. Like the, the representation of King Hagler is on the courthouse in Camden. 
If you've ever seen the Indian holding the, the bow, shooting the bow, that's down in Camden, it's on the courthouse. And um, so several years ago, my wife had my father-in-law make me one, a representation of a small representation, so I have one of those now on post in my backyard too, for King Hagler. And it seemed to the tribe that one of the, the Catawbas wanted to name their chief kings because they thought that they were so, they were so proud of King George and, and the white man's king. So they named their chiefs for about 150 years, they named their chief kings. So, now with, uh, with King Hagler coming about, he became a chief of the Catawbas when a lot of the headmen were killed on a trip where they had some of the the Catawba chiefs were on the way to Charleston for peace talks, and they were attacked by the Iroquois. Once again, the Iroquois. <coughs> so when they attacked and killed those headmen in 1750, that was the time that King Hagler became the chief of the Catawbas. Now, because of his education and training with the white men, he knew about treaties. He knew about how to to use legal aspects to fight for treaties. He had learned how treaties work. <coughs> so the biggest treaty that came about with King Hay was securing the treaties for his land <coughs> of the Catawbas. Now with the large land that they had at one time, there was the 1760 Treaty of Pine Tree Hill, which was the homeland of the Catawbas. And the settlers were once again encroaching and stopping, so there had never been a formal treaty to outlaw the lands of the Catawbas or the lands that they were allowed to use. So this was big in the fact that the 1760 Treaty of Pine Tree Hill really set forth the guidelines for where their homelands would be from then on. So the Pine Tree Hill Treaty, their lands were cut down to 55,000 square miles down to a 30 mile radius, which was about 2 million acres. And that was on a 30 mile race around the Pine Tree Hill just west of Camden, was their area. But the Catawba would be maintaining any of the hunting grounds across South Carolina. But they were supposed to be secured from the settlers and the colonists from coming in on their lands and moving in on their lands. So they did that move in 1760, moving to their sacred grounds of the Waxhaw Old Fields, which is about 60 miles west of current Lancaster. These were the ancient lands of Kofatachiki and where the Catawbas had lived and moved for years. Well, it wasn't long after that tree that Hagler was killed by the Shawnee. So on his trip back to his old fields of Waxhaw from Charleston, he was killed by a band of Shawnee warriors. Once again, the Iroquois. So the Catawbas and the Iroquois never got along. And they, they can really hold a grudge too, so. <laughs> now, not long after that, there was the Augusta Treaty. And that was when the government was trying to get more and more land for their settlers. So the lands were reduced in the Augusta Treaty down to about 15 square miles, or about 144,000 acres. So this document was used in the Augusta Treaty even up until 1993 at the last settlement of the Catawba lands. So that's how long that treaty was used. And this was probably the reason why the Catawbas were in fact not on the Trail of Tears, was because of the fact that they had written treaties with the governments, unlike any of the other Indians. So these written treaties saved them from that move. Now the Augusta Treaty, they used that in court later but they reduced their land down. So then they went from 155,000 square miles down to 30 miles, and now they're down to 15 square miles of the Treaty of Augusta. So not long after that, the Revolutionary War started. So no one was looking at pursuing any more treaties with the Indians. They had to worry about the colonists. Now, the Catawba did side on the colonists against the English during the Revolutionary War. And to make, self, make them different from the other Indians, the Catawbas wore deer tails in their hair so that all of them would know that they, they were fighting for the colonists. Now, under Samuel Boykin here in South Carolina, there were 25 Catawbas joined his command and they were paid 10 pounds each through the war. Now, there was another Cherokee War in the same time frame in 1776. 
And the Catawas, once again, were too glad to join the colonists to pursue into Cherokee Nation for a fight against the Cherokees. So, but at the end of the Catawba, at the end of the Revolutionary War, the two rosters that we have surviving list over 50 Catawbas as the Revolutionary War veterans. So, and uh, I'm proud to say that my eighth great grandfather was Robert Marsh. And Robert Marsh is the only Catawba Indian to receive a pension from the Revolutionary War. So, and I was telling Tom earlier, the way he used that for his proof of pension after the fact was using his family Bible. So he used his family Bible and the government accepted that as proof of when his children were born and where he was at because of the entry that he was fighting. He was fighting the British in one of the entries from his family Bible. So that was, that's amazing. Never throw anything away. <laughs> but to think that they'll use a family Bible documentation. So that's how much those family Bibles meant to the families even back then. So, but during the Revolutionary War of 1780, when right before the fall of Charleston and with Camden, there was the Waxhaw Massacre in the Waxhaws, and that was Bannister Tarleton, and we've all heard Bannister Tarleton. And so, bloody Tarleton, he, uh, the massacre there was when the soldiers were under a flag of surrender and he, he massacred them. Now, in the Waxhaw, that was not far from the homeland of the Catawbas at the time. So because of that, the Catawbas and a lot of colonists moved out of South Carolina, up through Central North Carolina, up above Albemarle, and then to close to Danville, Virginia, to the northernmost range of their ancient lands of the Catawbas. And they stayed up there for about nine months uh, until they moved back down here. So... That was a Revolutionary War, but with the 50 Catawas, so they had their hands in most of the fights in South Carolina to stay close to their homelands. And of course they would rotate in and out from their lands back and forth during their harvest times too. So that was why some of the, the commanders of the Catawas had such problems, a lot of Native Americans, because they would come and go as they pleased and couldn't keep up with them much. So. We come forward then to the next treaty with the Catawas, which was the 1840 Treaty of Nations Four. Now this treaty was trying to move the Catawas out. And it was just a few years after the Trail of Tears had started in 1830. And so because of the Trail of Tears, a lot of the settlers and colonists of South Carolina would want more and more land, but there were three three different parts of the Treaty of Nations forward. One, that the land would be given over to South Carolina from the Indians. They would be paid for the land, and then there would be a new tract of land agreed upon by the tribe. So the tribe had the right to agree upon the land that they were going to be sent to. So for the next 20 years, they kept going back and forth with the government looking at different places. Where would they move? How could they move? And in the late 1850s, a couple of Catawba headmen actually went with an Indian agent out to Oklahoma. So when they got out to Oklahoma, the Choctaw Indians of Oklahoma and, and territory, the Indian territory, was split up in different segments. And the Choctaw were the ones that allowed the Catawba to move there. And they said they would allow the Catawba. So when the Catawbas had decided that they would move out to Indian territory in Oklahoma, when they came back here, it was 1860. The South Carolina government cared nothing about Indian removal in 1860. They were too close to secession just within months after that decision had been made. So the Catawbas were never moved from their homelands. So, then into the Civil War, they had records of 17 Catawbas had been listed to the Confederacy. And Company K of the South Carolina 17th Infantry and Company H of the 12th South Carolina Infantry. And the names of those Catawba Indians that were in the war, the Civil War, were on the Catawba Confederate Memorial in Fort Mill, South Carolina today. So, they're there. And then skip forward to after the Civil War, in the late 1800s, around 1880s, a lot of the, the Bureau of Indian Affairs for the government started a lot of the Native American schools. 
one of the most famous being the Carlisle Indian Industrial School in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. Carlisle Indian School, uh, the Industrial School at the time, is now the, the Carlisle Barracks, home of the Army War College today, that the military sends their, their colonels and their generals for war college. So it's the same building there. The amazing thing about the Colorado Indian Industrial School was it was only open for about 38 years. Now, in those 38 years, they had 10,000 Indian children from 148, 140 tribes. But of all those 10,000 children that went to the school, there was only 158 graduated from the school. So, my great-great-grandfather, he ran away from Carlisle about three times. So we have got the, we've seen the document where he said ran away, ran away, once and time again from the Indian Industrial School. And it was a very regimented school that they had. And the director of the school at the time, he was, his philosophy was to kill the Indian and save the man. So there were 26 schools sponsored by the Bureau of Indian Affairs nationwide. There were a lot of other church, churches and private organizations that ran schools, but not quite so harsh as the one of, of Carlisle. So, but my great grandfather, Nelson Blue, and Samuel T. Blue was his father, but he ran away three times from the Carlisle School. So, when we skip the present day to the early 20th century, citizenship was granted in 1919 for Catawba Indians, only if they had been World War I veterans. So, 1919, World War I veterans, Catawba Indians were granted citizenship. They were considered as U.S. citizens. South Carolina would not recognize that. So they were still not South Carolina citizens. So, again, this fight continued for 30 years in the court for citizenship. South Carolina would not ratify it. Finally, in 1944, South Carolina ratified the Act Number 398 for citizenship um, for the Catawba Indians. So, that's how long my Catawba people have been citizens of South Carolina. <laughs> now, in the time period of the, the late 1800s and early 1900s, because of the attempted removal from them out to Oklahoma, they struck a relationship with the Mormon Church, Latter-day Saints, which Latter-day Saints considered the Native Americans as one of the lost tribes of Israel. So because of that, my great-grandfather, my great-great-grandfather, they're buried in the Latter Saint Mormon Church in Rock Hill. And my great grandfather actually, my great great grandfather actually spoke at the Congress of the Mormon Church out in Utah in the early 50s. So, then we skip forward to fairly recent. In 1993, South Carolina settled the court battle for $50 million according to the Treaty of Pine Tree Hill because Pine Tree Hill had been the original treaty document and giving the South Carolina, giving them a, not only a federal recognized tribe, but a state recognized tribe. But the Catawba being the only federal recognized tribe in South Carolina. And with those treaties, the Pine Tree Hill, Augusta Treaty, the Nation's Four Treaty, the Nation's Four Treaty was illegal to begin with because at the time it had to have permission of King George to have any kind of land settlement with the Indians. So the Pine Tree Hill Treaty was lost, the original document was lost. So it was only because of records used of the Pine Tree Hill actually existing that they were able to settle that court battle after about 30 years with the Catawbas. And today the Catawba Reservation is in Rock Hill and Chief William Harris is now the tribe. And uh, my second cousin had been tribal before, my great-grandfather, my great-great-grandfather had been the chief of the Catawas. And um, my uncle now sits on tribal council. So, that is my talk on the Catawas. Yes, Al? On the reservation, is there anything for the general public to come see, like museums or? In the long house there, they do have a, a small museum in the front lobby. And they do have their annual celebration every year in the fall. And it's usually, I think, the week before Thanksgiving. The what? The week before Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. Okay. The Yachtney Issa Festival. Also, too, what battles were they in during the Revolution? 
most of the ones in South Carolina, some of the larger rattles, we know of, uh, with Camden, not so much for Charlestown, um, none in the upstate for Kings Mountain or Cowpens, but they were known to be at Blackstock. Okay. Which is close enough, too. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Answers? Uh, what would we have to do to get up a petition to make you king of the Catalans? <laughs> <laughs> That's been our running family joke, Grant, for years that I was an Indian prince. <laughs> I have a question. You talked about those mounds in the beginning. Well, what did they do? Just move dirt, make it bigger and bigger, or was there something under them? Sometimes they're bare, and sometimes they were just ceremonials where they would get on top of them. Uh, and if you look at Indian mounds, most Indian mounds were made near a body of water. And I have been to Indian mounds all over North Carolina and Georgia. And when I went out to uh, Arkansas before, I stopped in the Indian mounds in Arkansas too and seen those. And the soda came through there. Um, the Indian mounds were places just for ceremony. They would have houses on top of them. But it wasn't so much as a constant we occupied village so much as it was a ceremonial place, maybe for harvest festivals or festivals throughout the year. So, but uh, if you've never seen Indian Mounds, I suggest see the Indian Mounds, the Etowah Mounds in Georgia are gorgeous, they're huge. And the one my wife and I saw down the Natchez Trace down in Mississippi are fantastic. Well, how big were you talking about? The Etowah Mounds are about 60, 70 feet high. Mm -hmm. Yeah, how so they're pretty they're tall. Big. They're a couple hundred feet wide or some of them. You'll be, you'll be winning when you get to the top of the Edelon Mountains. <laughs> now, and I want to know if your grandfather, if he ran away, did they force him to go back? They did. Oh. They did. I mean, who, who forced him? Like the family? Or? Sometimes the tribe would. Oh. And sometimes it would be the Indian agent who were on the, on the okay. tribal lands would do it. Why would the Indian tribe force him to go back? Weren't these schools? Uh, white indoctrination of they were they were so why would the Indian tribe force them to go back? Well, some of the earlier chiefs, like Bill Harris, a tribe in the late eighteen hundreds, he thought education was the way for the Catawbas to make their name and to make their way in the current world. And so were, he were thought these kids kidnapped originally, or were they did they they were not kidnapped. They were sent. The government sent them a lot, and the tribe was sent them with pressure from the government. But they thought education was the way, it was just the treatment of them. Because they wouldn't let them speak their own languages. And they wouldn't, they would, they would cut their hair just as soon as they got there, make them wear normal clothes to look very modern at the time. So. Have you ever seen the, the uh, shell mound at Edison? We have seen the shell mound, and there's one in Hilton Head, too. Yeah. But it was a lot of it because they destroyed the last two storms ago. I've never seen the Edison, the one at Hilton Head that you know, was in back in the woods of Hilton Head. Yeah. And that's a that's amazing amount of shells that you use for that one. Well, they, originally before the first destruction, they said that I don't remember what they said that how many miles out that they were visible. It was so large. Mm. It's really unbelievable when you think how many hundreds of years somebody was building a shell mound. I mean, yeah, and down in Georgia, you know, down in, in Hiawassee, Georgia, where the one in there, there's a gazebo been built on top of that one. So, but the man who owned the property, as you can see, the gazebo sitting on top of the mound up in the middle of the woods. And you know, down in Lawrence, there's the there's Indian Mountain Road down in Lawrence. And no one seems to know where the Indian Mountain is. I have done my Google search looking for the Indian Mountain, trying to find out the most likely place. When my parents' family moved down there 20 years ago, we had asked everybody around there, my brother in law, we've asked. Where is the Indian Mound? But nobody seems to know. So it could have been plowed under after many, many years. I bet if you ask NASA. Mm -hmm. I'm going to ask my Fish point down where Francis Marion is buried, isn't it? I'm sorry? Francis Marion, is there a mound there? I was just going to say, isn't Fort Watson built on top of the Indian Mound? Yes. I don't know. Yes. Yeah. And that's the big fort where Fort Watson was uh, built on the peak Indian Mound, and the British knocked the top layer off and built a palisaded fort on top of that. And it was a pretty good defensive fort. Uh, it took some doings to, to feed. 
That's between uh, Juan Pardo, uh, Dr. Gerard, Bill Fort San Juan. What would have been the nationality of the, of the inhabitants that he encountered? Would they have been Cherokee or Catawba? Or well, uh, somebody else? They weren't Catawba for sure. Yeah. They were not Catawba for sure. Uh, Catawbas were not even part of the Kofatatuki. They were just yeah. ancestors. And I've seen everything where they say that the Mounders were ancestors to the, to the Cherokee. But they think that the draw were probably later turned to the Shirals, depending yeah. on the pr pronunciation of it. I know there's a place in Morganton called Catawba Meadows. Yep. And uh, I didn't think the Catawbas were that far toward the mountains. I thought that was Cherokee country. And it was. But their land was far reaching because it went all the way up to central and went down, all the way up to the edge of Danville, Virginia. Mm -hmm. So it was a lot of land and a lot of tribe in between them. Why up then into um, parts of Maryland and up into Pennsylvania? Is there so much about the Tuscarora? Because the Tuscarora were a very powerful tribe. Of the Iroquois nations and all the League of Nations that the Iroquois had, but the Tuscarora were very well known around that area. That should be Virginia even too. Because the Iroquois, you know, they dominated New York for certain. Oh. Yeah, and it was strange that just before it came down, because they were hunting ground down into Virginia and North Carolina too. So they had ran into Catawbas forever. But it's strange that North Carolina has Catawba County and Catawba County schools, and we don't have a Catawba County here. But instead, we have York and Lancaster counties, which was named after the, you know, the Battle of the Roses in England. So <laughs> I believe I read one time that um, the, due to disease, the Catawbas were down to 150 feet. They got down to one of the treaties, there was only about 50 remaining. Mm -hmm. And that was just as soon as a lot of other tribes had joined them, because they, over the years, they had brought in so many other tribes. And the Yamasees dispersed after the Yamasee War. They could have joined the Creeks or some of the other Muskegon tribes. Um, but there was a lot of absorption of all the smaller tribes into the Catawbas. And sometimes they would bring the smallpox with them. The smallpox decimated the tribes, the Catawba alone, several times. And it could have been that some of the tribes you know, were even gone by the time that Juan Pardo and even the others came across because of their association with some of the colonists, with the Spanish colonists. So, um, like when Bartram, when William Bartram came into Georgia and he, he was going through villages that was completely empty, that had been empty for hundreds of years. Anything else? Yes, sir. Well, what percentage of any of the FTB to be recognized as Quetaro? Is it like 12 percent? Well, I am a quarter officially the way it looks in the books, but you know what? There might be just a speck of Quetaro blood because there were so many tribes in the Quetaro. But to be part of Quetaro tribe, you just need to have yourself um, linked to anyone on the roster except in 1959 was the last roster that was done. So anyone on the roster today has a roster number, and you must track yourself back to one of the top ends on that original roster when the tribe was disbanded. And the tribe tried to disband in the late 50s because they saw they couldn't get any recognition from the government, and they were going to sell their lands. Some of the tribe would keep their individual land and sell the rest for proceeds. But the state stops the individual sale of the land. So, and I know with the Cherokees, you know, to get any percentages of some of the refunds from some of the casinos and everything, you have to be like within an eighth percent or something of the Cherokee. So I don't know what roster you're using. <clears throat> the Catawbas are a, they're a mix of a lot of tribes of South Carolina, just because of the Sioux language alone. So when you fill out a paper, you definitely have to have the other. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's so cool. I guess so. I have a lifetime of hunting and fishing license for South Carolina, so. <laughs> so it's all worth it. <laughs> well, it was good with the settlement. With the settlement, they sent me a check, and then my three children got it, got the checks that went to a trust fund until they turned 21. Unfortunately, my oldest daughter was close to 21 at the time, so she got a far difference than my youngest son, who was eight years younger than her. So he, he got substantially more of, of income from that. So that, and it was strange because. Uh, 
Uh, we have six grandsons, and three of those are, are pale as can be, and the other three have the bright orange hair of Katabi and I've ever seen. <laughs> so. Well, thank you so much for coming out, and thank you for your questions, and uh, thank you, Tom, once again, I do appreciate it.